I think I've got to stand in the box here. So let me welcome you all to the Faculty 3 Minute Thesis event. It's nice to have you here. We've got some room up the front if, um, if you'd like to come and sit up here. Um, Dave, do you want to come and sit up here? No. Okay. No. I think everyone's got a seat. Um, so every year we have um, this event and it's a great event and we're really grateful for you to be here and particularly grateful for our participants. Um, I'm trying to use, not use the word contestant. That ups the ante a little too much probably. So um, although participants, contestants, um, battling it out for the prize, um, whatever you prefer. So welcome. Um, we hope that we'll spend a, a fun evening together. If you would like to get yourself a drink or something to eat, please um, feel like you can do that. Um, probably not in the three-minute time that uh, participants have been given, but um, may maybe around that. Um, now, I was doing a, a rough calculation on the back of an envelope before, and apparently it would take about nine hours to present an 80,000-word thesis. So if it's okay with everybody, we've got 10 contestants, nine hours each, that's 90 hours, okay? <laughs> So we've got, it's about four days, I think. So that would take us to Sunday afternoon or something or whatever. So um, that, that might be fun. I think it'd be a smelly room by the end of those four days and there'd be no food left and Sessioner's tweets would be coming more and more desperate. <laughs> so um, I think, can we go to the next slide, um, Alice, if you're able to? Now, we just want to encourage you during the evening to um, tweet... Um, or a post on social media about the event. Um, a sessioner, um, session, do you want to wave to everyone so everyone knows who you are? Session is our faculty marketing um, uh, head boss person. And um, is that the technical term? Probably not. Um, manager of marketing here. And so she's keen to um, promote the event and to let people know the, the good things that are happening here. So if you'd like to, I think that um, you probably add one to there. Um, the at Monash Education handle would be a good one to tweet to as well if you're able to do that. Now, let me just say a couple of things about the three-minute thesis. So the three-minute thesis, as many of you know, um, celebrates the exciting research of our PhD students in the faculty, um, particularly the brave ones who are willing to put themselves out there. There's lots of exciting research going on all over the faculty, um, but uh, those braver than most of us um, have uh, decided to, to put themselves out there. I tried for a couple of weeks to get a staff member to do a three-minute thesis as an example tonight. Can you guess what the response was, mostly? It wasn't, yeah, that sounds great. It was, no, I don't want to do that. In fact, David turned me down just today. Um, he, uh, several times. Several times. <laughs> so it's, um, it's, a, it's in a difficult thing to do, and I know that all our contestants are probably... Um, a little anxious, um, although I know that Stephen is not anxious. He told me before that he was um, a principal at Copperfield College for about a decade in his teaching career. And um, if you get to spend any time with Stephen tonight, you'll know that he's a pretty cool customer. So uh, some things don't phase anyone. But it is, a, it is a difficult thing to do, so we appreciate those who have uh, put their hand up to do it and to share their research with us. The three-minute thesis was developed by the University of Queensland, initially, and that competition and the idea has spread all around Australia and internationally. And it's really aimed at developing students' academic presentation and research communication skills. We had a masterclass earlier today, some of you were present for that, that looked at the issue of impact and evidence in education research. And uh, one of the key messages that came out from, from that masterclass was that having a PhD and not being able to talk about your work um, is it's only really half the journey. So many of you um, as doctoral candidates and research students and, and um, of course that includes Masters by Education research students and, and honours students who are doing research projects, are developing a whole range of academic skills. And one thing that the university is really encouraging and of course the faculty too is your ability not to just to write about your work but to communicate it in other ways. And so the three minute thesis is really a good opportunity to do that. So the hope is that three-minute thesis increases our capacity to effectively explain our research um, in ways um, that are non-specialist to people who might not be in our particular area. So hopefully that 
gives you some sense of what's tonight. Um, we'll talk about the rules in a little while. Um, our faculty round is um, tonight. Um, some of the winners from tonight will go on to compete in the Monash University final on the 16th of August. Now, that's held here, uh, during Winterfest. Some of you would be familiar with Winterfest. Monash puts on a big celebration over winter with lots of events. And the three-minute thesis final from Monash University is one of the centrepieces of that Winterfest. So we'd invite you to come along and support um, our education students when they compete at that event. There is a wild card round as well that the People's Choice winner will go into and the, and the winner of that wild card round also has a spot in the university final. Those, uh, the winner of the uni university final, of course, goes on to the Asia-Pacific final, which is in September. Thanks, Alice. Now, just to be clear, um, the faculty competition, we offer some really significant um, prizes. The winner will be taking home tonight. We we'll, won't be taking home tonight, but we'll write a cheque. It will take about four weeks to clear. The faculty's <laughs> finance department will then email us a, a copy in triplicate and we'll have to go and you know, apply for something. But eventually, our winner and runner-up will be taking home $1,500. The People's Choice Award, that we'll explain in a moment, um, we will be receiving a uh, Monash Postgraduate Association prize pack. So the MPA um, is a fantastic organisation here on, uh, at Monash that supports postgraduate students across um, the various courses that um, uh, we're engaged in. And so that prize pack includes um, uh, you know, a bunch of um, prizes. The Monash competition, the ante is upped. Um, and so as you can see, there's a $5,000 prize for the winner which is, I think, um, a fantastic way to celebrate um, exciting research. If you've any, spent any time on the Three Minute Thesis website, you'll know that those who win the Monash competition and go on um, are doing really, really interesting research and they really communicating that research in a fantastic way. So, great prizes. Um, whoever's the winner, I suppose, can take us all out to lunch when they, that cheque finally arrives. Let me briefly introduce our judging panel. They're here at the table, as you can see. Can you? Raise your arms, judges, and wave a little bit for us. So we have our Associate Dean of Graduate Research, Associate Professor Jane Wilkinson. She's our first. It's great to have Jane here. She's just come back from a trip overseas, so we're grateful that she's fighting jet lag and she's able to be here. Um, our second judge is our Director of Graduate Research, Associate Professor Joseph Agbanyaga. It's great to have Joseph here. Joseph's judged a couple of these competitions in the past, so it's good to have his experience and... and um, groundedness here and of course we have uh, our marketing uh, there you go manager marketing communications there's the technical term Sishna Maharaj is here too so we're really grateful to have um, a bit of glitz and glamour amongst the um, the, the staid and boring academics amongst us you're, you're the glitz and glamour so it's great to have Sishna's perspective on um, on marketing and, and presentation and communication here as well Briefly, you can see the rules up there. These are the rules that um, all participants are expected to abide by. Um, so if the first and biggest rule is really that there's only one PowerPoint slide. So we're compressing 80,000 words, or in the case of some of our, our students who haven't quite finished their theses, most of them, that might be compressing less. But only one slide, no animations, no transitions, no movement on the slide. Um, no additional electronic media, so no sound files or anything like that, no video, um, no props. So um, Tanya, I think, was thinking about bringing a prop in. Tanya's my PhD student. I have to confess that now. I think she's fantastic, um, but she can't bring any props. We were thinking maybe that she could bring her daughter in and her daughter could run around. That might, you know, soften the hearts of the judges or something or towards her. But uh, So no, no costumes, musical instruments or props. Now, three minutes, of course. Anyone exceeding three minutes is disqualified. So I've got Kate Wilson up the back. Kate's in our graduate research office at the back, um, and she's going to be timing and giving some warnings to our competitors, um, a 30-second warning and a 10-second warning. Um, so please um, be aware of that. We don't want to disqualify anyone. Well, actually, it might be fun to disqualify a few people. but. So presentations are to be spoken word, so no poems, raps or songs, unfortunately, but we could sing later if you'd like. <laughs> um, presentations have to commence from the stage, so people can't sort of run into the door and do a cartwheel and bounce off a table and start, although that would be quite fun, wouldn't it? Uh, maybe we need to contact the rule makers and change that. 
um, and the presentations begin as soon as the speaker begins. And so what I'll do is we'll um, introduce the speaker. They'll have a slide that says their name and the, pr and the name of their project or the presentation, and they'll be up here in this box as well. And as soon as they begin, their time begins. Okay? And, of course, the decision of the adjudicating panel is final, unless, I think, any inducements you'd like to change your decisions? Maybe if you can come up with some creative things, we could, uh, we could do that. So those are the rules. Now, um, timing. Each contestant will do something. I'm not sure what they're going to do. What's the next bit there, <laughs> Alice? <laughs> I don't know. Something or other, OK. Each contestant will present on their work, um, and it's going to be fantastic. What we wanted to do, though, to begin, before we go to pre our presenters, is we want to um, give you an example. If you haven't seen a three-minute thesis before, Andreas Villamazar was our three-minute thesis um, winner in the faculty, and he was a finalist in the Monash competition um, last year. The video you're about to see is Andreas presenting his three-minute thesis at Winterfest. So those big letters behind him, that's sort of part of the Winterfest. So we thought that might set a scene because no academics were brave enough to come and do it. We, um, oh, you changed your mind yet? No. OK, so we might um, let Andreas run there and um, I'll pop back after. One of, my, one of my PhD participants shared with me an eye-opening experience. He was teaching English in China and chose to use an image of a couple having breakfast in their pajamas. He was puzzled by the reaction of his students who were giggling and whispering. So concerned, he went and asked one of his Chinese colleagues what was going on in this picture. She looked at it and confided in him well, they've got bare feet at the dining table, so this probably means that they've been making love. <laughs> this is just one example of how we don't see anything neutrally. Rather, we bring meaning to all those images around us, depending on the cultural context. That ability to engage with an image, interpret it, and give it meaning based on our, on our personal worldviews is called visual literacy. In my PhD, I explore visual literacy in adult English language teaching. Let me give you some context. The huge arena of adult English, educa English language education in Australia has a very narrow focus. Courses for overseas students teach reading and writing for university, and programs for migrants and refugees seek to enable them to operate in everyday life. But how do educators know that all those images around us and in textbooks make sense to adult learners of English? My study delves deeply into teachers' understanding of visual literacy. I asked them if, how, and why they use images in the classroom whether they were ever taught how to do this, or if they're simply trying to catch up with new pedagogies. I learned from teachers across five English language centers that they do use images, but this happens sporadically and instinctively without clear guidelines from curricula. I also learned that a teacher training does not explicitly address visual literacy nor do adult English language programs. My research will bring visual literacy to the forefront of our adult education system. In turn, teachers, researchers, and policymakers will be empowered to guide adult learners from diverse multicultural backgrounds so they can critically engage with images and use this knowledge in and outside the classroom. Thank you. How good is um, Andreas? He was fantastic, wasn't he? Um, and I'm sure that we'll have some fantastic um, presentations tonight. 
I think we're done. I think I'm done anyway. Thank goodness for that. And you're all thinking the same thing. Let's get on to the main event. So I'm going to invite Stephen Townsend up to um, the box and um, let Stephen prepare himself and let the judges get themselves organised. Judges, when you're ready, just give us a nod and then Stephen can begin. Welcome. Each year in Australia, 50,000 students enter Australia's secondary schools two to three years below the required reading age. What do you think happens to those students? That plan data shows us quite clearly, by the time these students get to year nine, nearly 9%, nearly 100,000 are two to three years below the required reading age. If you enter an Australian secondary school two to three years below the required reading age, by the time you get to year nine, your reading skills will have declined. Jeremy, one of those students, when he looks at texts, that's the sort of thing he sees. He gets disengaged very quickly. He finds that he just can't make sense of the material presented to them. He very likely drops out by the end of year 10 and quite possibly joins the 70% of prison population who are functionally illiterate. Clearly a problem exists, and this exists right across the Western world. And it's got a social and economic cost. But surprisingly, there hasn't been a great degree of research into this area. And little of that has been in Australia. As I started to going through the literature, I came across a quote, and it was so important, I want to include it here. It was by Peter Freebody. There is a limited body of research that has approached the question of effective literacy teaching and learning from the ground up. That is by examining schools and classrooms, now remember that, that are performing more strongly than demographically predicted and by attempting to confirm hypotheses from such smaller scale research about the critical features of those sites. Therein, I found my focus. I identified eight schools with large numbers of struggling adolescent readers who were performing significantly better than required. I went into those schools, I looked at their school overall program, I interviewed principals, their literacy leaders and their teachers. And a story has begun to emerge. The story is of principals focus on literacy. It's about schools that use literacy experts to work with their teachers. It's about students in small groups. It's about mainstream classrooms that are using age-appropriate literacy materials. So this picture is developing. I'm still going through the process of the interviews. And I think it's an important story that's coming out because I think the Jeremys of this world need to hear that story. Schools that don't know what to do with struggling adolescent readers need to hear that story. And I think it's very important that we give some hope to the 50,000 struggling adolescent readers who enter Australia's secondary schools each year. Thank you. Thanks, Tan. Take it away when you're ready. What are the stories that shape a nation? How do we learn them? How do they define us? Stories are complex and powerful, but all stories are not equal. Some stories get told and others are silenced. And some stories simply don't cut through the noise, through the debates of citizenship, of resettlement, of immigration, integration, and ultimately of difference. But all stories are important. They're important because they shape our lives and the ways we relate to each other and the world around us. And schools are significant storytelling institutions. They pass on a nation's stories through curriculum, school subjects, structures, language, literature, histories. Schools are where we learn, through the learn from and learn the stories of who we are and who we are not. One story that is commonly told about Australia is that we are the most successful multicultural nation. Our Prime, our Prime Minister claims that we are not defined by race or culture as many nations are, and yet stories that define Australians by race and culture are ever present in our daily lives. Imagine this, a public school classroom where a Catholic teacher is told she will go to hell because she eats pork. A schoolyard where a young white Australian male 
taunts and mocks a young Afghani girl across the, across the yard, calling her a lebo. A school where South Sudanese students are told to remove the braids from their hair because they do not meet the school's uniform policy. What stories did these encounters tell? What do they mean? And why do they matter? My work explores how everyday understandings of culture and difference, as produced through story, are integral to getting along in multicultural societies. I'm interested in how our stories of culture and difference produce exclusion, belonging, ambivalence, telling many of us that we are Australian and that we belong, while telling others, particular students, that they are different, that they do not belong. Through their everyday work, teachers act as the narrators of diverse lives and encounters, navigating stories told and the stories we tell. Engaging with these stories matter. They matter because they initiate an encounter, an encounter in a moment, in a place, and enable a reflection on the stories we tell and the ways they impact on those deemed other. Thank you. All right, Fatima, it's time to enter the box. <laughs> whenever, you're, whenever you're ready, you, you uh, take it away. I use this picture as a metaphor. Like the race course, our society also wants to keep us on track. If we run out of the track, we will be disqualified or discriminated. And uh, our society create the standard path for us and provide guidelines and training so that we can follow that path. And uh, the society doesn't hesitate to uh, exercise power also, same as the jockeys using their sticks to control the horses. The problem is the social track is made considering the uh, convenience of majority people, or how the ruling authority wish to make it. Then what about others who are not belongs to these groups? If we look back in history, the colonizer treated the colonies as uh, uncivilized, uncultured, as they failed to see the different kind of cultural resources in colonies. Similarly, in male-dominated society, people cannot see the contribution of women in development. Now, hope we got the point how difficult it is to accept the differences. And here is the motivation of my study, which aims for social um, justice in education. In our community, some children are labeled as disabled, as we cannot see their different kind of abilities. A child who cannot see doesn't mean the child will not be able to read or write. The child can read using fingers instead of eyes. A child who cannot hear your voices, but able to communicate using alternative voice. If we can allow all children to participate in different social settings, any child will be able to reach the finishing line, maybe in different way, in using different or alternative path. So in my study is exploring how the educators and the children with disabilities themselves creating the, their own pathway to reach the developmental goal in mainstream preschool settings in Melbourne. And the initial findings indicating that teachers' creative support and also the students' agency in participating in different activities make it meaningful their participation in my participatory preschool setting. So hope this study will be very small step, but very significant step in the race of inclusive practice in PA schools. Thank you. We proceed. Thanks, Tezin. Whenever you're ready, just uh, okay. into the box. In my year eight class in 2004, my English teacher gave us an activity, which was to look at a few letters to the editor about the Iraq war. I had recently arrived from Jordan 
And a few minutes into reading these letters, I felt that these were very inaccurate perspectives. In Jordan, anti-war sentiment flooded the streets and all living rooms were switched to Al Jazeera, streaming the latest casualties. So I put up my hand to ask, rather rhetorically, why did Australia invade Iraq? And my teacher, taking the devil's advocate position, said that it was to spread democracy in the Middle East. As a 12-year-old, I was very hesitant, but I made a few statements about how unjust the war was. And one of the students told me, why do you care so much? You're in Australia. But I did care, and I did feel that these were topics that were directly about me and that impacted me personally. And so in my research project, I like, I like to explore how Muslim-related topics are experienced by Muslim students, what Muslim students consider to be Muslim topics, and how they respond to topics such as these. And to arrive at these answers, I take a counter-storytelling methodology by interviewing Muslim graduates from high school, public high schools, and I ask them questions about their experiences and their stories. And through documenting these stories, what I have seen is quotes such as this, that it was fully on about us Muslims. And this reflects the sense of burden, the sense of um, surveillance, but also confrontation with dominant Islamophobic narratives in the classroom. And so my project is really about documenting the experience of learning in a post-September 11 era for Muslims and about some of the experiences of trauma, betrayal from dominant curriculum narratives, but also what I like to look at is how Muslim students respond to these dominant narratives, whether it's a sen developing a sense of empowerment by putting their hand up and presenting an alternative perspective, or whether it's about developing a sense of resistance or solidarity. And my hope is that through these stories, I can really present a need to consider how dominant discourses have an impact on brown and black students in Australia. Thank you. What do you see in this painting here? And can you hear anything? The scream, the painting by Eva Munch, a very powerful message about human condition and emotion. And this is also my feeling when I listen to my participants in their interviews and also when I transcribe the data and making sense of my data. So let me invite you to zooming in in the University of Good Practices in Vietnam. And to get in, we need a ticket. And the policy on digital technology in English language education is a ticket for me to get it on the campus and make 37 interviews with the staff members. And I have listened to their concerns. I have um, looked through their practices. And I have found that when technology is more than devices, when policy is more than just the document, it is the human factors that is at heart of the university practices. And when technology doesn't guarantee quality in education, and when policy doesn't guarantee good practices, it is human factors and also the leadership and the leadership at all levels, the grassroots, the middle level, and from the top that matters, that creates practices. I have so we have zoomed in here. Now I invite you to zoom out in here, the field of higher education, the universe of higher education. Gravity holds everything together, but gravity also trapped a lot of things. And um, I ha by listening to my participant, I have learned that they, have, they are aware of their difficulties. They learned to defy the gravity, to move to move up, to take the flight up, and look at the tensions when technology doesn't guarantee um, good teaching and learning, but somehow at the same time, why it on one hand it improves 
learning. But on the other hand, it's also making education a service, commodify it, and making it unequal. So, but listen carefully. I have realized that screaming, I, I, I have listened to different laser, layers of screaming at, in this university, and I have seen how screaming can be both negative and positive, and how we should care for our universe, university. Probably hesitant at the beginning, but I care. But getting more deliberately, but I care, and putting it into practices, putting it into changes, from individual changes. It can lead to social and structural changes at large. Thank you very much. Know yourself. This phrase has captured my imagination ever since I was a nine-year-old girl. I read in books that philosophers regarded it as the most difficult thing to do, and mystics considered it as a way to reach God. When I was 20, I had the chance to know Ustad Elohi's philosophy of natural spirituality. The philosophy proposed the idea that I can know myself by practicing ethical principles. Eager to try, I started systematically practicing being kind, responsible, and non-judgmental. Every day I woke up, mindful of my ex spiritual exercise for the day, and tried my best to do it successfully. The proposed idea proved to be right for me as the exercises gradually opened some doors to hidden aspects of my soul. I began my research not only because I wanted to share my experiences with other spiritual researchers in Australia, but also because I wanted to investigate my improvements methodically. And the research fulfilled both my expectations by highlighting the cultural aspects of my stories and putting my experiences into conversation with the experiences of other researchers, I could write a thesis that can motivate others to share their stories of their spiritual journey and enrich the field of self-exploration research with their diverse voices. My thesis creates a space for all people to appreciate their uniqueness and their personal ways of spirituality. But the research benefited me personally as well. The analysis showed me that although I'm only at the beginning of my path of self-knowledge, I have actually moved a few steps forward. But my biggest finding? One day, when I was struggling to complete a part of analysis, and I was looking for motivations behind one of my actions in the past, a vision came to me. I saw my inner self as an infinitely vast space with millions of doors still waiting to be opened. That every opened door had just led me to more closed ones. That was the day I truly understood that comparing to the things that I do not know, what I know about myself is nothing. Perhaps we researchers need to stay happy with these tiny steps of ours, don't we? Thank you. OK. Kyrule, why yep. don't you uh, take it away? Yeah. If you're ready. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Convention on the Rights of the Child are two examples that provides universal guidelines for human rights and human rights education. My slides also shows two very pathetic examples uh, of human rights violation from Bangladesh context. As a researcher and teacher educators, I was just questioning myself, what is the role of education? Especially, what is the role of schools to minimize this kind of violation or to remove this kind of violations? However, the research has shown in spite of some modest successes, most of the countries in the world largely failed to involve their schools in promoting human rights education in a meaningful way. This is also evident in Bangladesh. 
Therefore, my research aim to develop how aim to how school can develop human rights education, considering the universal concern and local context. My research takes slightly different approach since I conducted research with the participants rather than on the participants. I conducted, I collaborated with a secondary school in Bangladesh, and I had been working for three months with the school leaders, classroom teachers, students, parents, and the members of student councils. At the first stage, my research identified that the school was not promoting human rights education explicitly. Even the teachers are struggling to connect between the universal concerns and local context. However, we worked together and developed a context-based and action-oriented model of human rights education in the school that ensured student voice and participation as well as connection between universal concerns and local context. We plan different activities and engage students, such as debate, role-playing, developing wall magazine, encouraging community people to increase human rights awareness, as well as we engage students for the development of school environments. I found that students are very motivated to do that kind of activities, as they were, as they were, they were find that because that kind of activities are mostly related to their rights and the rights of the others. I learned from my research that the development of students' uh, thoughts and behavior are in potentially influenced by the plan activities that ensures the uh, interpretation of human rights instruments given the student's social context. However, one year later, I went back to school and see the progress, and I can say, Awesome, this school could be able to establish a culture of human rights education. Thank you for listening. Thanks. I'd like you to meet Sally. Sally has two kids and enjoys nature walks. I want you to notice the precious bundle that Sally's holding close to her chest. I'm talking, of course, not about her baby, but about her mobile phone. If you're like Sally and you can't go anywhere without your mobile device, take heart, you are not alone. Australians spend an average of seven hours a day with screen devices. But as the time we spend with our devices explodes, we have less time to do other things. Now, for most of us in this room, it probably doesn't matter that much. But what if you're a small human being dependent on another human being for your very survival? Or, in the words of Helen Lovejoy from The Simpsons, will somebody please think of the children? That's where my thesis comes in. I'm examining the impact of parental device use on parent-child relationships. Attachment theory tells us that children need certain positive parenting behaviours to develop a secure bond with their parent. One of these is sensitive, timely responses to a child's needs. Another is open, warm and loving communication. But my area of research is showing us that parents are actually replacing time with their child with time with their mobile phone. Or if they're not, they're using the device and the time with their child put together. But because of the rings and dings of the device, the quality of those interactions is going down. Meaning that parents are basically looking at the device instead of their child. My research sets out to understand, should alarm bells be ringing for us? In my first study, I'm going to be observing parents and children together in a shopping centre. I'm going to be seeing, do parents use devices? Do they use the device instead of focusing on the child? And just how do children respond to this sort of device use? In my second study, I'm going to be putting parents and children together in a room and recording their language. I'm going to be comparing parents who use devices to parents who don't, hoping from that I can understand does the quality of their language and the amount of language they have go down when a device might be present. But I'm also hoping to add a positive glimmer to this field. I'm going to be investigating whether parents and children using devices together could actually stimulate opportunities for secure bonds. Early research signs suggest that when parents and children use the device together, language might go up and they have new opportunities to interact in a positive way. 
So in conclusion, I'm asking, is the most significant relationship of a child's life under threat or does joint device use give a new opportunity for a stronger bond? Thank you. Do you remember how you play in your childhood? Did you pretend to be someone or something? Like a princess with a beautiful dress, a warrior with a sword in hand, a dragon, or a superhero? Let's pretend to be is commonly heard from children as the sign of an imaginary world being created. That is play, all about creating imaginary situations, and it is the leading source of children's development. But what about play at school, at kindergarten, or other early childhood settings? Think about an angry child at school saying, I want to play. How do teachers respond to this? Are children not allowed to play at school? Do most teachers expect children to sit, complete tasks, and follow instruction? What about teachers' understanding of imaginary play in children's learning? These are the questions I'm trying to answer. In my study, I explored the implementation of play in children's learning. The conception of play and how play is implemented has prompted debate for many decades. Teachers' understanding of play will influence the implementation of play itself. My PhD, creating a playward approach in the Indonesian context as an innovative teaching strategy to support children development through creating an imaginary play. This is a practice based on children's literature, which is improvised to take teachers and children into collective imaginary play, and they also share responsibility for engaging in the joint play. I filmed nine teachers and 38 children for 10 weeks as they develop a, a collective imag imaginary play in their learning. I do this because there is a lack of literature on how to support teachers' play pedagogies. This approach can be used around the world as a potential pedagogical tool to support children's development. Why is this important? Well, think again. Most of play is structured by teachers and, and uh, focus on cognitive development that is highlighted in most everyday practices in early childhood setting. Actually, developing early childhood teaching practices means we are better developing our future generation. Thank you. When is the best time of learning in life? The answer is the early years. Therefore, we want to our children to become confident and involved learners. However, how confident are our teachers? How about those pre-service teachers, especially those from international backgrounds? Early childhood education actually contains lots of terms and activities which are culturally specific. Now I would like to ask you another question. What is finger knitting? For those who don't know this term, it is an Australian handcraft activity using yarns and it is taught to children in early childhood context. One of my participants, an international undergraduate pre-service teacher, was asked to teach finger knitting on the first day of her very first placement. Can you imagine how she felt? Panicked, stressed, anxious. Yes, in a word, her confidence was shattered in her own English language competence as well as her ability to teach children. Actually, she had a solid background of English language learning from both experiences in overseas and in Australia. And from the culture that she was from, like early childhood education is highly structured, which means that, uh, thing, that means the play-based activities such as finger knitting is not her strength. However, she was not prepared for this culturally specific context. Therefore, my research is to fill this gap to looking at international pre-service teachers' experiences in their professional experiences. So I aim to provide an opportunity for this international pre-service teacher an opportunity to be culturally become prepared and also they can become competent and confident early childhood professionals. 
In the meanwhile, I hope to offer some insights to the policymakers as well as stakeholders and university uh, placement offices, so they can know how to engage and support these international pre-service teachers before and during and after their placements. Hopefully, they can be more prepared. And in this way, the early years of children's lives can be optimized. And this is the best investment that we can make as a society to ensure their future success. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. That's, um, that's all of our competitors. Can I ask you again to um, congratulate them? I'm sure you'll agree that there's some really interesting projects there, really interesting research going on. What an amazing place to do a PhD. Um, we've got amazing academics here in the faculty. <laughs> fantastic people and fantastic students. So it's really gratifying to see all the hard work um, that just our contestants have been engaged in and to imagine all the sorts of work that's going on beyond that um, by many of you. So fantastic stuff. Thanks again to all those competitors. We're going to move now into um, uh, our people's choice voting. That will give the judges a little bit of time to confer about our um, runner-up and our winner. So I hope you've had a chance to, um, to enjoy something to eat and to drink. And um, we, we're going to go through um, the prizes now. And before we do that, though, I'm going to invite the judges to offer a couple of reflections if they'd like to overall about um, the things that stood out to them, some of the positives, some of the things that perhaps they felt could, could be done differently or, or um, yeah, differently, I suppose. So I'm going to invite Jane to do that. Jane, you can, do you want to come up or do you want to sit there with your mic or what, what, what's easier? Absolutely. No problem. sure I speak for all of us to say um, what a fascinating um, set of... Oh, do I need... I don't think... You'd I have to put it on, but in terms of capturing oh, the audio, okay. you're going to have to speak sure. into it. So I speak into which bit? That bit? Speak into my lapel, if you okay. like. <laughs> so in terms of the... Um, the the uh, actual presentations, I think that we, we talked about the range of, of topics was so varied and I think that actually is one of the strengths of a faculty of education is that there is such a variety, fascinating variety of work that people are clearly um, conducting in the area. Um, and it says something I think about our faculty and the very comprehensive nature of being a, a, a faculty of education. Um, so fascinating and diverse research topics. Um, another thing for me that I am, I am humbled but also delighted by is the different contexts in which the, um, the research is being conducted. So in Bangladesh, um, looking at Chinese students here, um, Vietnamese um, in Vietnamese higher education, as well as some perennial topics. So I was talking to Stephen about the, you know, for example, English secondary education in Australia and some of the deficits there. So, you know, just that the wide variety of contexts. Um, so I think we all felt that the presentations in terms of content and explanation were were really clear. And and all of us have been PhD students. And we all know how tough it is to do the elevator pitch. You know, so from the first time you get into a PhD, your supervisor is nagging you and saying, if you're in that elevator and you have to explain in 30 seconds what your PhD is about, can you do it? And it took me three years to get to a point where I felt I could do it. So, um, you know, I'm so impressed by the fact that, that all of you were able to nail it in three minutes. But I'm going to hand over to Seshna and Joseph because I'm sure there might be just a couple more things you want to add. Really, I just wanted to congratulate everybody because I can imagine how much work went into preparing for tonight. <laughs> so well done to you all. So the job of my team is to share your stories and I was so impressed by everyone's stories. So you'll be getting an email from me. <laughs> so um, yeah, well done to all of you. It's so impressive. And I'm going to be talking to my team about coming up and speaking to you all just to hear about your stories and all our research students because there's, there's gold here. <laughs> so thank you all. Well done. <laughs>
Okay, I don't have much to say, but just to say to you that all of you are winners. <laughs> so if you don't have a prize today, it doesn't mean your, your work is not um, an important study. Um, they, I also want to give you an advice about how to summarize uh, your thesis, a three minutes thesis. A medical research are very good in doing this. So some of you, if you wanted to know how to even summarize 80,000 words in just three sentences, go and um, download um, journal papers that are written by medical research. They are very, very good at this. And that would be a secret I would like to share with you. Thank you. Thanks, Joseph. That's an interesting secret. <laughs> I know what you're reading lots of these days, med medical journals. OK, so um, thanks to the judges. It's been great to have them here and they've done their work and, and we'll let you know what the results are. Before we do that, I'm going to uh, give each a participant a certificate. We have a certificate of participation. That's not sort of a, you know, thanks for coming sort of certificate, but it's a, a certificate of, of recognition for the work and effort you've put in. So let me just grab those. and. Um, yeah, when I read your name, if you can come up and grab your certificate, that'd be great. Stephen. Good work. Tanya. I get to do that. Fatima. Tasnim. Lynn. Well done, Lynn. Congratulations. Hello. Thank you. Kairou. Thank you. Well done. Thanks. Carrie. Adi. Fantastic. Well done. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> and Hell Run. So you're all winners in, uh, in our book, of course. Now, we do have a couple of uh, prizes to give. So we'll, we're going to start with our runner-up prize. And now... The prize is this lovely um, cardboard box. <laughs> so we, we hope that um, our runner-up enjoys that. And of course, um, we also have a, a cheque for $500, which isn't here tonight. I did ask Kate if she could get us one of those big cheques, <laughs> but um, we, 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 couldn't, we couldn't find one, so you'll have to imagine that. Now, our runner-up award goes to Halle. So congratulations. <laughs> Oops, no, I've made a mistake. No, I'm, I'm serious. Come. No, I'm serious. Sorry, that was horrible. Come. Can I get a <laughs> you can. So why don't you, why don't you hold that oh, and hold that and Thank you. we can get a picture. We'll just take this off. Thank you. Now, those of you who have been around for some time know that Ella has presented in a couple of three-minute thesis competitions. So... The fourth one, okay, not a couple, four. Oh, there might be a rule against five. Is there a rule against five? No, that's the last. Well, we're really grateful to have you submitted, have you? That's fantastic news. Yeah, we hope uh, you, you hear successful news soon. Now, our People's Choice Award, um, the prize has been don donated by the MPA. Um, here it is here. It's another cardboard box. That's nice, isn't it? And a, and a letter or a card. Now, People's Choice Award goes to Howran. So, come back up here. Thank Congratulations you so again. Thank you. There's your certificate Thank and card. There's your gift. Thank you. And I'll just whip this off again.
Now, our winner tonight, um, I think you'll agree when um, I, I let you know who it is, really did a fantastic job. And um, our, our winner is Kerry. So. Oh, yeah. Fantastic job. Yeah, fantastic job. Here's your gift and your winner certificate.